Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to CIJ Summer Conference. It's day three, um, and this is our second talk of the day. We're delighted to welcome Dale Maharich and Mary O'Hara uh, to CIJ Summer, both excellent writers and excellent storytellers, and they touch um, the subject that is very difficult to tell. And hopefully today they can share with you and all of us um, their expertise and knowledge and um, share some uh, ideas of how to tell the story of poverty sensibly, sensitively, and um, in, a, in a very nice way. So um, I'm gonna leave them in charge. Please, uh, if you have questions, if you're listening on Zoom, leave them in the Q&A section, not in the chat. You can chat in the chat, but questions please in the Q&A, there will be time to answer. And please share on Twitter, um, if you're doing it, please use hashtag CIJ Summer and tag us in. Uh, it's at CI, CI Journalism. Hello there. I guess it's up to us, Mary. Um, yes. We're oh. both going to introduce ourselves, and we're both very bad at this. So just bear <laughs> with us on the introductions. Uh, my most recent book is, I'm going to hold it up without the, the, hopefully it's not backwards, Fucked at Birth. Um, it's a journey across a pandemic America. This little ga this gas station had this uh, this abandoned gas station had this American flag painted out front, all faded and chipped. And I went inside, and there was a graffito "fucked at birth." And so I decided to go across America last year and show everybody the picture of the exterior of the gas station on my phone, uh, and then the the graffito inside, and said, "What does this mean to you?" Um, and this is based on 40 years of documenting poverty in America, working class mostly, but poverty. Uh, and um, I don't know, I can't, it sounds, people think I'm being a, 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 a humble brag. I don't know how many books I've done. I've, I've uh, written books that then have been updated and reissued. Uh, I've been doing this for 40 years and um, my expertise is America. I hope some of my um, comments can help you folks in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, but I, I can speak to the American experience mostly. So, Mary? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here today, albeit a bit sleepy because of the time zone that Dale and I are in. Um, I've been a journalist for around 20 years, and about 15, 16 of those have been spent concentrating on a whole array of social issues, poverty and inequality, um, being probably the most prominent and certainly the most pertinent at the moment and in, um, in the sort of mid pandemic universe. I've written two books that are focused on poverty, austerity, um, the impacts of those, the narratives around those. I'll do what Dale did. This is my latest, um, <laughs> The Shame Game, uh, which uh, was published um, last year, actually just at the start of the pandemic. Um, and it focuses specifically on the narratives around poverty um, in the US and the UK. It's a comparative book. Um, my first book, Austerity Bites, um, much like Dale's experience of doing the traveling thing was traveling around the UK, documenting um, the impact of austerity in the early days of the coalition, then coalition government in Britain, um, and talking to people who were on the receiving end of these policies. It was, both the books are very much concentrated on the voice of people with lived experience of these issues um, because they're often neglected. So that's me. And I have to apologize about my background. I'm squatting in a garage in San Diego, California. And so it's become my office. <laughs> um, when I started this work, Mary, and I, you know, I think we can talk a little about history and context and then bring it forward to how to cover issues today. Uh, especially in this post-pandemic economic world we're in, uh, which has only exacerbated the one percent, uh, uh, the wealth of the one percent, and the the, the uh, lessening of wealth of, of the masses. Um, my motive always has been to show how uh, this affects real people, ordinary people. Uh, I don't. I'm not a policy guy. I don't cover. I quite brag and I, I don't report inside the Beltway in America. I report very much outside the Beltway. Uh, so I like to humanize my stories. And uh, the, the first thing I, I did on this area was um, back in 1982, I jumped on a freight train uh, and uh, with uh, these new hobos who were seeking work. And I learned that they were all coming, not all, but many were coming from the industrial areas of the United States. And it was like the 1930s, they were, they were Trying, using the trains as, as basically vehicles to get 
from point A to point B to look for work. Um, and that was very elemental. And it taught me as a very young reporter, journalist, writer, that, that that's where the story is. And, and I've continued it, that methodology today. Uh, I'd rather talk to the guy pumping gas, the person at the uh, 7-Eleven, than, than the politicians and to show what uh, 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 is going on with real people. At the same time, I get into big issues. Uh, one of the things I get into at Fucked at Birth is uh, I did a lot of um, a history of the 1930s and the rise of fascism. Uh, and I think that's something that we have to keep in mind as we report the high and the low is the political outfall of this. Uh, you know, I was not surprised about the Capitol riot in January. A lot of my colleagues in the Beltway press were. Um, but so to me, the most important thing is talking to quote unquote real people. And I think Mary, that's you, that's your totally your forte as well. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that your work and my work has in common. Um, and I think it's a very important um, part of the sort of collage of journalistic output out there because, um, and we can't deny it, that resources are tight in most newsrooms right now, all over America. Uh, local newspapers have been closing for quite some time now. So there's less and less opportunity in many ways to have a nuanced perspective um, from the broader population. It's often, you know, we're often relying on uh, Vox Pops and, you know, uh, surveys and, and things like that, when actually what they can't provide is the deep nuances that come from human beings who are experiencing in their everyday lives, the fallout of the policies that we hear about. So every time you look at a front page um, uh, in the past six months, and it talks about in, in the US rescue packages for people, etc. I mean, what does that actually mean for people? Um, journalists are often in the position where They've got PRs calling them that, you know, they're talking to like policy wonks, etc. And that can distance the issues from the people actually involved in it. And in my experience, all too often, when we do have people with experience of an issue featured, it tends to be sort of a case study. It tends to be, oh, here's someone experiencing poverty. Here's someone who can't get health care. Here's someone. And it, it makes it kind of one dimensional and I think we lose something in the storytelling if that's what we rely on. But I also appreciate that that's one of the things confronting journalists today is how do you get the time, the space and the resources to do this kind of work? Um, and I think that's a, it's a great loss that we don't have thriving newsrooms that can have reporters all over the place digging around on this stuff over time and producing sort of, you know, really great high standard serialized um, stuff. There's just not enough of that, I, I don't think. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's so true. I was just up in Sacramento, California last week, uh, the Sacramento Bee where I worked for 10 years, um, they were tearing the presses out of the building. Uh, the paper still exists, but now it's in a storefront and it's much reduced staff. We had the quote unquote luxury of time, but at the same time, I, a lot of my work in the 1980s at the newspaper, I did on weekends and nights. Uh, Aaron Copeland, the famed composer has a saying, if you don't work hard in your, your 20s, no one will love you in your 30s. And so I kind of uh, embraced that mantra. Uh, so yes, it's very, very difficult. And I, I have students, I teach at Columbia University, I teach journalism. And a lot of my, my students, I, I stay in touch with, with, with many of them. And they're, they're confronting exactly what you say, Mary. They're, they're very uh, overworked, uh, uh, understaffed newsrooms, but they're still getting good things out there. Um, and again, they're working, they're taking my, my advice or just in, embracing it organically where they're working nights and weekends. Um, uh, I like to think, uh, you know, there's a lot of outlets today where that you can freelance for. So, you know, I always considered, and even in the heyday of newspapers, the, the newspaper was a day job. Uh, and at night I did my work and uh, I did several of my books when I'm still at the newspaper. So I think that, that it's, it's, it is much harder today and I didn't, I, you don't have the support of a lot of newsrooms, but I think we can cover these things if we're creative and think in terms of, okay, in, in the, in, uh, if I'm working in um, uh, the UK, I can freelance maybe to an American publication. If I'm, um, my students uh, poach and they write for the Guardian. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, uh, I've had, I just had a student last fall do a story about a, a, a 
African-American community that had sewage leaking over, over the place and the Guardian published her piece. Uh, so uh, uh, there's ways to get things out there. It's not easy. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to make paint it rosy, but we, we, we can do these stories. Well, I did, when you're doing these sorts of stories, Dale, what do you, you know, what's your approach when you're talking to people, when you're trying to sort of excavate um, the sort of the experiences and the, and the the attitudes and, you know, in general, how people are feeling about their circumstances? I like to ask you what I call a central question. Now, what I just told in my book, and I, I had that graffito inside, that was a very obvious and kind of like a duh central question. But I, when I'm doing like uh, the evictions, okay, I, part of my book is on uh, homeless. There's, uh, cannot believe how many homeless people there are in Los Angeles and Sacramento, California. I ask everybody pretty much, well, I, I want to see how they're living. I want to, I want their history, of course, but I, 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 I what's the outcome for you? What are you, how are you surviving? What's the outcome for you? And I ask pretty much, I try to have the same question for everybody. So when I'm writing, I can write with authority. Uh, you know, the, how many people are working or not working? Many homeless people actually have jobs. Uh, uh, and if you can say, you know, in several dozen interviews, half the people uh, are working, it's, it's, it, it gives a sense of, um, uh, the, the, the situation with, in a way that can be meaningful for people, perhaps people who are uh, going to read your story or listen to your, your, your podcast or your, see your video, uh, some sense of, okay, they're not lazy, they're working. Uh, or if they're, um, they were evicted because they couldn't pay their rent, um, uh, again, just trying to get that empathy of the, of the reader, the listener, I think is very important. I want to focus on commonalities, dignity. Um, the, one of the characters in uh, the, the Fucked at Birth, she's homeless on the bank of the Sacramento River and she cooks for the community. It's, they've developed this little village in the woods by the river. And it's, a, it's very neat, very, I noted and I took pictures, it's very clean. And, and they have these, these movie nights and any, they're, just, any, they're just like everybody else. They're not other. I try to make uh, the people I write about relatable to just a wider audience or somebody who may not uh, have any understanding about these issues. Yeah, that's kind of mirrors the sort of approach that I take as well, which is uh, one of the things that I um, end up focusing on because it, it ends up becoming so obvious when you're talking to people um, is the sense of uh, pride, independence and agency that people have who are often painted, you know, that horrible word vulnerable, which is used to sum up such a broad swath of people. Like these are people made vulnerable by society. It's not because they're intrinsically vulnerable. Um, the things that often come out of those sorts of interviews and interactions is people's strength um, and people sort of, uh, strangely entrepreneurialism, even though they're depicted time and time again as lazy, you know, some of the people that I spoke with for the shame game, which for those who don't know is part of a, a larger multimedia platform project, um, amplifying the voices of people with lived experience of poverty. So lots of different kinds of um, platforms uh, showcasing it, but people um, are often like really super keen to talk about what they're doing for themselves, what they're doing for the people around them, for their communities, what works for them, what doesn't work um, for them. And it never ceases to you know, surprise me how the sort of broader media often doesn't tap into that expertise um, and that, that viewpoint. And I you know, spent a fair amount of time down at Skid Row in Los Angeles for this book, because that's like, four miles from where I live um, and there's no way to miss this because it's probably the most visible sign of destitution um, that any of us encounter on a, on a daily basis. And the thing that always comes through, absolutely always, um, is people just doing their best. You know, this is not a bunch of lazy people. This is a diverse group of people who for various different reasons have ended up in an awful situation. I've met people who 
um, women who were homeless with four kids, you know, on their own, who were dumpster diving, who were eating food out of dumpsters because they, they didn't have a welfare state that would support them properly. Um, how enterprising do you have to be to be seen as a full human being in our society? Every, it's just incredible to me that we still um, fall onto these lazy tropes and stereotypes about people experiencing poverty and destitution when the reality is, is so different. People's lives are hard, but they're trying their very best on the whole um, in a society that vilifies them. And that's the UK and the US when people you know, fall through what is supposed to be a safety net. Yes, um, it's, it's um, uh, difficult to show other kinds of working class issues. I mean, uh, the, the homeless are one thing, but we have many, many people uh, and, and this is true everywhere, who are quietly struggling. They're in a house and you, you interview them and then you, you, you look in the refrigerator and this has happened so many times for me and it's empty and they have children, uh, they have jobs. So they're not uh, on skid row and they're harder to get. And those are the stories that I think need to be told as well, uh, 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 equally well, because uh, again, the invisible poor, this is where the the, the, the mass of people, there's the 1% and there's like the 60% uh, in the United States. And the 60% are uh, everything I read, all the studies I look at, all the government reports, they are gonna be doing worse in 10 years, not better. They're already doing worse in this so-called recovery. It's not just the 1% that's doing really well. I'm in the top, I don't know, <clears throat> economically, I'm losing my voice here, it must be the mold in the garage. Uh, uh, the, the, the top 15 or 18 percent, okay, uh, you know, um, who are doing, I'm doing quite well right now. I mean, uh, uh, it's, I go out and I, I report and it's, uh, it's a startling, uh, even to me after all these decades of doing this, just how this bottom 60 percent economically is not doing well. So trying to find the invisible poor and how do you, how do you, find, how do you find them, Mary? I mean, what, what ways do you use to get those stories out there? Well, often, um, I, this is something that just happens when you've been in this field a long time, is people often find you as well. So um, a lot of the time, um, people will have found me through researching, um, writing and work around this issue. Uh, I mean, primarily because people don't want to be exploited and don't want to be taken advantage of. And, you know, um, certainly in the UK media, there's a lot of that where, um, you know, people who are struggling or need, say, government assistance, the equivalent of food stamps and things like that. When they are found, they're talked about terribly and they're talked down to. So people come to me that way often. They'll tell me that something's happened in their family. Someone um, has had their benefits cut, for instance. They're, um, when austerity was rolling out in Britain, one of the one of the most absolutely awful, tragic things that happened were people who were taking their own lives because they couldn't survive. They just couldn't take it anymore. Um, and people were desperate to have those stories told, were desperate to have those people centralized. So strangely and horribly, there was no shortage of people finding me um, because I was writing about this stuff already. Um, but equally, it's about, you know, being in communities um, and talking to, I mean, I, I mean, it's easy for me. I'm Irish. I will talk to the leg of a chair if you let me. So I do end up, um, you know, and the, the good thing about being a journalist is you're often on your own, sitting in places, um, wandering around. And I just talk to people and people talk to me. And I, that's when I'm most comfortable at my work is sitting having conversations and then you're put in touch with people. And then you, you, know, you dig below the surface of someone and you realize, oh, hold on a minute, this person is barely getting by. Um, they don't want to tell you that initially because it's, it's embarrassing. People are really embarrassed by how they're viewed and telling this stuff. Um, so I end up with like a sort of, like an assortment of avenues where people find me, I find them often community organizations or uh, groups of activists who um, are, their, their lifeblood is being in contact with people. But also because, like for myself, because I grew up in poverty and I have, you know, I suppose a kind of personal experience of, of this issue. Um, I am at my most comfortable as a journalist when I'm sitting with people whose experience I 
can actually understand firsthand. And I think people spot that. I think people feel okay talking to me because they know that I, I'm upfront about that um, with interviewees. I, you know, I'll always let them know that, you know, that's where I come from. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, I think a lot of my colleagues who teach journalism in the United States are very much, you don't reveal anything about yourself because ergo that's bias. Um, I, I don't agree. Uh, to get people to trust me, I have to I have to reveal. I have to tell some secrets if I'm going to get any secrets. And so I, I didn't grow up in poverty, but I grew up working class. My father was a steel worker. Uh, that helps me relate to people. Um, but there's other ways if you're if you grew up in, in you know, for those my, my students who grew up in, in, in very good circumstances, there's other ways to, to relate as well. You don't have to be working class or poor to, to talk you, do these you, stories. You can use what you have. I mean, that's that's the thing. It's tapping into, you know, what is your personal and professional resource that you have that I mean, because I do think you have to build trust, right? I mean, you can't, you know, you can't write on this subject or work in this field without being confident that you can help build the trust of the people that are confiding their often very personal um, stuff to you. And for me, that's being able to say, you know, I, I really hear you. Um, for other journalists, it would be slightly different. But I think maybe you and I would agree that like genuine empathy is absolutely core to this subject. Uh, I can teach that. I can teach journalism how, how to write a lead, how to tell a narrative story, but I can't teach empathy in my students. And most of the students, I think it's a self-selecting group of people who are probably watching us. Uh, yeah. If you're if you're watching this and coming to this this conference for this, this this talk, you care about these issues, and that goes a long way. And so uh, I just hung before I left New York outside my door. It was a tweet I saw. Some Canadian uh, journalist put it up. He said. When you when you when you write about um, the rich, that's called objective journalism. Uh, if you write about the poor, you're you're, you're biased, <laughs> and I've ha I've had that my whole career too. Uh, but caring about people, that's bias. I'll take it, you know. Um, uh, yeah. So you 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 connect with people, but yeah, you said next, I want to circle back to something you said before. If somebody's newly homeless, they're just evicted. Again, we're, we're seeing a lot of evictions despite the moratoriums and such here in the United States. They're, people are proud. They don't want to admit they're, they're as hurting as bad as they are. Mm. Uh, I think don't take things at surface. If, yeah. if you can spend, don't just go do one interview, come circle back, come back two or three times. Uh, it also helps to have the, the in sociological terms, informants who assist you. Uh, in this book, uh, I didn't know this gentleman, but I uh, there's an organization in Sacramento called Lows and Fishes. It feeds uh, homeless people and helps people get housing. And I, I wrote out of the blue, and and the the, the outreach worker uh, Joe Smith was amazing. Uh, he he knew my work, which again this was an advantage uh, of, of being a, a a more veteran journalist where you're going to get that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think he would have helped me regardless. He's that kind of, he was homeless himself. Mm -hmm. and he took me into this, these camps in Sacramento and I covered the homeless in Sacramento 40 years ago. And there was maybe three, two or three dozen camps hidden in the weeds. I mm -hmm. went into the woods and there were, he says, oh, there's probably as many as 9,000 people back here. It was like an entire city in the woods of people homeless. Uh, it blew my mind. Um, uh, and so even at this stage of the game where I've been doing this for so long, I, I, I was shocked. And again, I, I, he took me to people because I had him as my entree. Uh, it cut through a lot of time. There's, I didn't have the luxury of time. It's everything. I had a two, two and a half weeks to go across America for this book. I, I couldn't spend two and a half weeks in that camp. So mm -hmm. getting the right contact person to help you, um, uh, people, food charities who give out food, are very, very good uh, mm. to get at people who are, you know, you wouldn't otherwise get. That one of the things that always um, comes up, and actually this, you know, does come up because in the academic research um, and in the policy research um, is that people don't like to say that they're poor 
Um, and it's often like the first thing you'll face when you're working in this area is you'll look at the statistics or whatever and they'll say, oh, X percentage of people live in poverty by whatever definition is being used at whatever time in an individual country. Um, and it does shift and change and it is challengeable. Um, but on the whole, you know, people don't want to be seen as poor, described as poor. Um, even if you're living out of your car and you're working at a warehouse um, and like, you know, you're just scraping by. Um, and that does make the area often quite a difficult one um, because, you know, you're prescribing in a way someone's situation, not as, as they see it. Um, but it's, it's a reality. It's one of the, I don't know what you find deal, but it is one of the realities that you face when you're dealing with this area is how people view themselves in their situation versus the objective reality of well, actually in this society, you are actually living in poverty. Uh, and that always, I always find that kind of heartbreaking in a way because it's, it is the objective reality, but people are hanging on to whatever they can and not being labeled is a huge part of that. Um, do you find that a difficult thing to sort of navigate when you're writing and when you're, you know, telling your stories? I know, I, I know oh, I have to do that. Oh, totally, totally. And this is where I, I, I teach, take a journey with somebody. In other words, don't just do that one hit interview, spend time. And like, for instance, in today's context, right now, if I were 23 and reporting, uh, again, this is my American context, I'm not speaking about Europe, uh, uh, so I, I, I know this here, I would want to document somebody becoming homeless. So if I'm at a news organization and they're not giving me time, but I have, again, nights and weekends, I might go interview somebody, if maybe find through, I would go to advocates, there's the California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation here in California, for instance, who helps people navigate. Uh, there's a, there's a, the eviction uh, project in LA. There's a, a group of people who are trying to help people avoid eviction. I would go to them, win their trust, and then try to find somebody who's housed right now, struggling to stay in their apartment, um, and, then, and then go back and keep on it. And maybe by the time in a month or so when they are evicted, they are homeless. They know me. They trust me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can tell a story in pieces. It's not just one story, but it could be the story of the Smith family, you know, pre-homeless, homeless aftermath. And if mm -hmm. you, and that's a journey. There's something moving there. There's, there's, a, there's a narrative arc. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not tell it all at once. You may tell it in pieces, the Smith family. And that's, that's actually beautiful, I think. And there's also the thing where sometimes you'll be talking to people in a particular setting uh, about a particular aspect and they'll bring up something that's not actually what you're working on in that moment and might not even have occurred to you. And I often just, like I just said, I often say, oh, that's in the bank. I'm holding that because I'm coming, I'm coming back to that. Um, and I, I think that's what, certainly one of the things that's been most important to me putting books together where you're trying to draw in um, maybe a lot of the stuff that you just didn't get to put anywhere, but that is really illuminating. Um, and I, I, I personally find that that kind of, you know, accidental research in a way, um, a, a very rich seam um, for, the, for the work. Uh, like, I, strangely, like the shame game came about because something kept being repeated to me when I was doing interviews for the first book. Um, and the, the first book had a chapter on this sort of stuff, like narratives and framing and how people are talked about and how poor people are vilified by the political classes and the punditry and, and et cetera. And, I and that ended up turning into the second book and the, big, the bigger project because it occurred to me, people are spontaneously telling me that it matters how they're talked about. It matters the sorts of, um, sort of meta narratives that exist in our societies. And they were telling me in, in fragmented ways and um, unprovoked. And I was scribbling like crazy, you know, making sure that I was understanding this. And, and over a, a year, over two years, I thought this is much bigger than I think it is the impact of this. So then you start writing stories about stories, which is sort of interesting because I've never gone down that route before, but. I mean, I was wondering if you have that kind of thing happen where 
you're just you're sitting stuff in one bank because you you, you sense that it's important and you go back to it. Oh, absolutely. Um, the anger that we see we saw at the Capitol riots. I, I'm not that smart. I'm not a rocket scientist. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of just muddle along and talk. I listen. That's my job description. I listen to people. And I, I was uh, one of my focus communities is Youngstown, Ohio, where there were many steel mills industries, and they declined. And I, I, I saw this anger rising. And again, anybody who visited there would would have heard it. And it, I kind of banked that. And I wrote about it in my 1996 reissue of one of my books, where. Uh, one of my sources, a labor studies professor, said this anger is going <laughs> to play out real bad. We're, we're in for a repeat of, and I thought he was overstating it at the time. We're yeah. going to see a, a president elected who is going to exploit this. And of course, 20 years later, he basically predicted Trump without using his name. Yeah. Uh, but I was, it was in my in vocabulary, and I had actually written about the anger in that book and other places. Uh, and the problem with this kind of journalism, though, is if you're a pioneer, you know pioneers get arrows in the back. Uh, doesn't mean necessarily you're gonna you're going to change policy immediately, but over yeah. the long period of time, I think we have impact, and I I hope we have impact. Maybe that's a thing we can talk about. Do you think you have impact in your work? Well, I think that's a really really interesting point because sometimes when you're just grafting away at this stuff and you're trying to make sure that you really understand what people are telling you and you're trying to communicate that it might you might not be communicating it in a moment where the wider um culture is receptive to it um and i don't know if you get this but but certainly i you know i would be critiqued you know for being for being like alarmist or you know for i don't know not exaggeration, but kind of making more of something than it actually is. I'm like, well, actually, no, I'm just telling you what, what I'm seeing. And I certainly felt that at the beginning of the austerity journey that I did um, back in 2011, 2012, because everyone I spoke to who had, like, I'm speaking to your family and they know how much income they have on a weekly basis and a monthly basis. And they know they're already struggling. And they're looking at these new policies that are coming in that are gonna strip away what little bit of safety net they have. And they are telling me, this is gonna get really desperate. You know, We're being asked to pay more for things that um, we don't have the money for. There is gonna be increased homelessness. There are gonna be people's, um, people's really struggling with their mental health. That'll put pressure on the health service. You know, that sort of domino effect. Um, so I'm documenting this, and I think there was a general sense, oh, well, it won't get that bad, you know, it won't be that bad. And the horrible thing is, four or five years later, to see that the stuff that you, that you were putting down at that point, come in, you don't want it to come to fruition, you don't want people's fears and anxieties to be realized, and then you watch it happen, and it's truly awful. Um, and I remember specifically the moment when suddenly the word austerity started appearing in news broadcasts, having been a word that actually seemed to be being avoided. And I thought, thank God they're paying attention to this right now. But, you know, back at, when food banks were just beginning to open properly in the UK, a phenomenon that just really didn't exist not that long ago. Um, and I was going out to those as they were opening and writing about them at that point. And I couldn't believe five years later how many of these things there were, but at the time it was seen as like a blip. It was seen as, oh, well, you know, it's not gonna be that bad. Um, but you can read the signals, I think. And when everyone in every part of the country that you're going to is pointing this out, I mean, wouldn't you be a fool to say, no, I don't think this is happening. I think this is, you know, I want to believe in a nice, comfortable middle-class world that this isn't happening, but it is, you know? Yes. Yes. Well, denial is I think, just a middle name of, of most Americans. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's very difficult, and I I'm looking at you know the next work in this area, and I I, I I've done a, a lot, and I'm really right now I'm obsessed with the political dimension in that what's going to happen in this country in 2022, 24. Uh, same thing in, in European countries. I mean we we know the the what's going on in Poland and. Uh, you know, just 
it's crazy. And so uh, anything you can do as a journalist to bridge understanding of that political dimension, I think is very important as well. I became a student of the 1930s. Uh, I always kind of was, but after I started hearing and seeing the anger in the 90s, I felt it was incumbent upon myself to read a lot of the literature from the 30s. Uh, not just the, uh, the, the obvious things, but the books that were written at the time by authors like, uh, there's an author named Louis Adamick who did a book called My America. He was an uh, immigrant from U U U uh, the Slav Slavic states, I forget which one. And um, uh, he, he was amazing. He um, uh, documented America in the 1930s in a way that I learned from. As a, as, a, as, a, as a working journalist decades ago. And I kind of went to some of the places he went to and I kind of replicated some of his methods, um, but also the political dimension in terms of, of the rise of fascism in the 1930s. Uh, and it's, it's, it's you know, I, I sometimes feel I'm, you know, people, hyperbole is, 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 is the name of the game these days. People just scream from the rooftop and, and but, you know, we are at a very uh, distinct crossroads in the United States right now where these voter suppression measures that are being taken, uh, two state, uh, Texas and Arizona may, may have the, to the point where they can overturn the will of the voters, the legislature, and there's no protections. Uh, we saw, if we get a smart Trump in this country, it can be as bad as the 1930s, uh, at least from American perspective, and we see in European countries where that's already happening, the repressions in Poland, uh, uh, you know, know. Um, journalists are being crushed, they're being, they're, they're being uh, arrested in some cases. Um, so this is, the, this is where the larger geopolitical issues are very important. So I try, I try, to, try, I try to keep all that tied with the human element. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a lot, of, it's asking a lot. How do you, how do you do, how do you handle it? It is, ask, it is asking a lot, but I, I, I think that, um, you know, you said this story is about poverty or this story is about inequality, whatever. Actually, they're all about power, right? So, all of these stories right. are about power who has it and who doesn't have it. Um, and in relation to poverty uh, and low wages and those sorts of issues, um, you know, voter suppression is important in that arena because, you know, the assumption used to be, well, poor people don't vote. You know, you don't want poor people voting because they're going to vote in their own interests in the way that other people do. So these things are like, you know, there's always an angle on something like this that is absolutely related. And I think that the one thread that runs through everything is power and the lack of it. Um, yes. I don't know what you think on that. Well, we have a lot of questions and actually uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer one then I'll, I'll, I'll maybe, maybe you can, you can jump in as well. Uh, here's, and again, I'm just going to, there's, there's several here that I like, but just, I don't want to, uh, uh, I want to, the person, an anonymous attendee asks, how do you prepare the people you interview and feature your, in your work for publication? In other words, I'm understanding, uh, uh, basically source, um, management, like Mr. Smith, Mrs. Smith bring me into their lives and I'm going to write about it. Uh, they might not understand. This is how I understand the question, what it means to become a front person. Uh, and it's, I, I take it very seriously. Uh, people who are not used to dealing with the press, I kind of prepare them that, you know, I'm going to write about you and I'm going to put you in the newspaper. I'm going to put you, well, I, I, I'm doing more audio now, put you on in, in a podcast, how, you know, get them ready for it. And I, I, one story I like to tell about that is, Back in the year 2000, I did a story on uh, hunger, child hunger in America for a magazine called George Magazine. It was a political uh, uh, magazine of, of sorts uh, that was uh, asked me basically to write 6,000 words on poverty in America. And I found Maggie Segura in Texas um, who uh, uh, understood what I was doing. Again, I got, I got her to, I met her, met her in a food bank line. I went to her home several times and then the third time I went to visit her, I said, people don't understand what it means to do it. You're a single mom working. Could you share your budget with me? And that's asking a lot. Again, going back to what we talked about at the start of all this. And she did. I broke down her budget, what she spends on, to the 
for toilet paper. I mean, it was really a, a big list that ran in the magazine. Well, you know what you're showed... spending, Nicole. You know what you're spending because it's like to the cent. To the exactly. You know, yeah, you've seen it. And I published it, and I, I never forget. Uh, this was still 2000, but she had an email. Uh, it, a lot of people didn't then, but she did. And she emailed me right away. I sent her the article. I always send people an article, uh, mm. a link or a physical book. I, 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 I feel it's incumbent upon me to, mm. to nurture and, um, and, and they should see it first from me. And her response to me was, thank you for caring about single mothers. Mm. Um, that, I, I'll never forget that as long as I live. Uh, she, to her, she felt honored to be, mm. to be picked up. But, but to get somebody to that stage, you have to walk them through what it means. And I, I try to do them, the, the, in, in ter American terms, the Miranda warning, the, you, have, you have the right to remain silent, you know, uh, yeah. you have the right to remain, you know, anonymous. Uh, I don't want to- That they have the right to walk away. So yeah. I think, um, I don't know about you, but when you're interviewing someone over a period of time or you're coming back to them or whatever, their individual circumstances can change. Um, so there have been times where I've met and interviewed someone and they were fine to talk to me at that point, but then something happens and they're actually much more uh, in a much more difficult space than they were previously. Um, and this may mean if, if you're a journalist and your editor is pushing you to go and get people to talk on the record or to reveal their stories, um, it's a hard thing to do, but you have to make that judgment call about the degree of harm you might cause to a person um, in the pursuit of like shedding light on this subject. So I think that, I mean, that's something that I'm very, very cognizant of when I'm interacting uh, with people is, you know, it is read the room. And this is where your empathy really, really matters because the last thing you ever wanna do is cause harm to a person whose circumstances are already actually quite harmful. So you have to, you know, be very careful, very cautious, um, you know, never sensationalize, uh, you know, make sure that you're basically handholding a person. Uh, one of the things that I've done many, many times to protect people is to make sure they were anonymized. A lot of people don't want their picture or, you know, their voice um, out in the public domain, but they have a lot to say. And I think if you've got a relationship with editors where they know, I mean, they know who this person is, you know who this person is. If it's a broadcasting, you've got your release form, you understand all of that, but you can still protect that person whilst informing the public. Um, and it's hard because editors want a face and they want, you know, real people, whatever that is. Um, but I think that this isn't one of those spaces where there are often multiple traumas and in many ways you're managing trauma all the time talking to people and with experiences like this and I, I I mean I'm sure you feel the same way though but this is like this is such an important aspect of this work yes and trauma and you have to think of your own trauma to uh, mm -hmm. doing this Another question here is, um, and this is, I'll, I'll let you, I'll throw this one to you and then I'll throw my uh, two cents in. How do you, how do you avoid clickbait? You know, this is, this is something that, again, young journalists are dealing with. They, they, editors want, you know, traffic. And, and what's your solution for that? My main solution is uh, take, doing less work, um, earning less money. Um, and that's, that's the absolute truth of it. I just have to draw lines about where I put my work. Um, uh, you know, I've had, you know, fairly big rows with, um, editors about this kind of thing. And, uh, I mean, I've had things where, um, I've written a very nuanced thing, like really toiled over putting something nuanced together and then a headline goes on it. Um, and trying to explain to people that on the whole, you're not writing your own headlines and it's the headlines that the, you know, the algorithms are fishing around for. Um, it's a really problematic area in my view, um, because it can completely distort what's actually been depicted in a much bigger piece. Uh, so 
<laughs> I mean, my honest answer is I walk away from work if I think that's going to be an issue. Um, and I take the hit on that. But I, I think it's particularly difficult for people at the start of their careers or who are, you know, because you don't have any power. Again, it comes back to power. <laughs> this time it's what power does the reporter have? Um, and I don't know what the answer is to that right now, because that's how news organizations compete with each other is, you know, that's how they bring money in that, you know, it's all tied to a much bigger system. Um, but I think every reporter has to work with their own conscience. I, I'm gonna, I, I'll give my answer and then we're gonna, uh, Marina, you can, you can then maybe moderate the rest of the questions. I, I think, um, uh, I tell my students, if I were starting out, if I were 22 or 24 today, 25, which is the average age of our students, I would work somewhere for a couple of years and maybe one of these sweatshops where you have to crank out stuff because you need to get gain cred. You have to have uh, uh, chops. Know. Yeah, but at some point you you find a way and, and I, I, I'm viewing journalism more as an art form uh, mm -hmm. as time goes on um, where you have a day job that is mindless and maybe half time. Like I have students who write um, features for university, you know, a department. They have a little newsletter and it's a 20 hour a week job. They get benefits and then mm -hmm. you, you, you live frugally and then you do the longer form stuff, yep. you freelance, but you can't make a living as a freelancer today. You need some core something. And I think that's probably what I would do if I couldn't get a job at a, a major place that gave me time. I would get enough chops. And then, and my students are doing it. I see them doing it and it, it works. It's not for everybody, but it's a one way to practice journalism. Yeah, or just to learn the skills, right? So, you know, you can be working in audio and video stuff that's not necessarily journalistic, um, but like if you're learning really good, if you're learning to cut tape really well, um, and if you can sometimes like tell a story that's like about a very boring subject and bring it to life, that's some good hard skills. Um, so you might not be thinking that you're Lois Lane or something, but you're learning some really important skill sets and honing storytelling and all that kind of stuff. Like copy editing, things like that are just really, really good. I mean, I always say when I was doing mentoring for younger journalists, I always said the best thing that ever happened to me was the thing that I thought I would hate the most, which was being a sub editor. Um, you know, cause I wanted to be out talking to people. I wanted to be doing all of this. Um, and there I was at like 11 PM sat trying to figure out a headline for something or, you know, tidy up someone's copy. And it seems tedious, but my God, does it teach you things that are really useful. Um, in terms of self-editing, in terms of, you know, maybe puncturing your grandiosity a little bit and, and things like that. Lot, all of those things can make you a little bit of money, but they hone the core skills. Um, and that then that allows you to be, a, if you want to be a writer rather than a producer or whatever, allows you to be a better writer. So when editors pick up your copy, they go, oh, this person knows how to stitch something together. I mean, it sounds dull and basic, <laughs> But it helps in every aspect, I think. Exactly. So, Marina, I mean, we're going to let you ask the last couple of questions from the from the, from the audience. So well, I don't think you need me. Um, uh, there is a really good question there about funding of journalism. Sort of logically leads from what you've just been talking about. How? Uh, what do you think about? how journalism can be funded and not rely on advertising, big corporations, big money paying for it, especially in the context of talking about that's a tough one uh we're talking about two things here individually which we were talking about earlier how one can engineer their careers to do this kind of work but the the larger issue of funding journalism oh my god uh, that's a uh, if we could figure that out uh that would be we'd be billionaires because yeah, we, we, we have a, solution for a future i i don't I, I don't think i'm qualified to answer the bigger one well, the strange thing is before I was a journalist, I used to work in advertising and in sales in um, the media. So one of one of my jobs was bringing in advertisers and um, generating revenue. So I, I actually know what it's like to be on that side of the business. Um, I did that for seven years and uh, it was tough as hell, even when 
there was a lot of money pumping in. I can't imagine what it's like trying to do that right now. I try to bring that money in. But on the on the sort of bigger picture, there are sort of upstart media that um, manage to do really sort of good work um, through subscription models, for instance. You know, in the UK, um, it's like Byline Times works on that basis. There's a a small magazine in Northern Ireland called View Digital that I've written for that has a subscriber network as well as local advertisers. I think there are ways to do this, um, but it is the perennial um, worry and concern. Uh, and also with advertisers, it's the how much influence do they want question. You know, there's so many things tied up in this. Um, you know, there's the sponsorship road that um, some organizations go down. Like I know, for instance, that the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation sponsor some articles in um, some newspapers. Um, you know, there are ethical questions to be asked around, well, what does that mean for the copy being written um, when different external organizations are involved in directly paying for it? I had a, 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 not really a friend, but a person I knew in Sacramento, Kurt Guyette, did a, uh, 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 went to the Alternative Weekly in Detroit and he got laid off. And the ACLU hired him as a journalist. They, at that point, ACLU hired American Civil Liberties Union, one person for the border and him in Detroit. He broke the Flint water crisis story. Right, and yeah. he won a Polk Award for it. Uh, he, I think, I can't say this for sure, but I, I think he was up for a Pulitzer, but I think they, they would not give it to somebody who was funded by an organization like that, even though I think the ACLU, ACLU was neutral and not everybody sees that. So there's these, these beautiful bright lights. There's, there's ProPublica, there's, there's these local uh, uh, Texas uh, um, uh, uh, Tribune. Uh, they're doing amazing stuff and they seem to be working. But individually, one thing I'm gonna try uh, with this next project of mine is the sub, a Substack. Uh, I'm not going to go into the topic of what I'm writing about, but it's something that I think could have an audience that could fund me doing this next project. Uh, I think there's enough of the people and foundations have told me, oh, there'll be an audience for that Substack. Yeah. So mm -hmm. not poverty, though. you can't get a Substack for poverty. That's not going to work. But for certain kinds of stories, it could be a way to fund things. Mm. Another very good question is, um, do you get accused of being biased? It's kind of, <laughs> sort of hard to be balanced about poverty, but how do you deal with it? Well, I quote, there was a, a Archbishop of Brazil, Brazil, and pardon me if I butcher this quote, but he said, when I feed the poor, they call me a saint. Dom Helder Camara. When I feed the poor, they call me a saint, when I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. Um, if being biased is caring about the welfare of masses of people, which translates to a healthy democracy, I'm biased. But yeah. I don't think that's bias. I don't. I just, Mary, I don't know how you feel about that. I just think it's part of this this bigger, wider narrative around this topic. Um, in the same way that poorer people get dismissed. Um, as not having a valid point of view um, and are denied influence. If you're in that space, uh, trying to tell those stories, trying to talk about people's experiences, then yeah, you get dismissed too. Um, and I'm like, I'm okay with that because I, you know, I don't have a problem with being a campaigning journalist. I know some people do, but over the years, um, I became more of a campaign and journalist, actually, because I, I thought, you know, there are just certain truths here that are being distorted or not told at all. Um, and I actually think it's a journalist's job to go and root those out, to go and find those and put them out into the public sphere. Um, but yeah, you're going, you know, you're going to get accusations of all, all kinds of things. But I totally agree with you. I think, you know, if if what I'm trying to do is amplify things that are otherwise um, suppressed or ignored or distorted, then yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, there are actually two questions that sort of could work together. How did the term and sort of 
what we understand under poverty changed over years. And also there is a sort of follow up with this different question, but it sort of interestingly falls into it about poverty of information, that people don't have enough access to information because of their social sort of circumstances. How would you describe it? What's changed? Has it, have you seen a change over the years? Or is it the same thing? Well, I, when I started this work, I jumped on those freight trains with, with new, the new job seeking uh, homeless. Life magazine commissioned a story and they said, we want, the ideal is a man and a woman and a child on a box car. So Michael S. Williamson, the photographer and I searched for that mythical couple. They didn't exist. We did not see women uh, very much. A few homeless women mentally ill, one or two random, but not job seeking people. By the time our book came out in 1985, I was being criticized in the, for the writing part. Well, it's a good book, but he doesn't have women in here. Well, by 85, there were women on the road. Uh, it had changed that rapidly. And of course, today, my former student and friend, Jessica Bruder, did the, the book Nomadland, which became the Oscar winning movie with Frances McDormand. And now you have these communities of women who are older, uh, who are living out of vans and and and. and other vehicles who are working full time, and it's a it's a whole massive community that didn't exist. The numbers of homeless, for instance, I would look in the weeds for them back in the early 1980s, and now you can walk anywhere in any major American city, especially where it's warmer, and here in California, and see teeming thousands. So uh, the volume has increased. What I guess. I'm depressed by is, I was naive enough when I was young starting this work. Well, if I write about it and expose it, something will be done and we'll solve it. Um, and I'm frustrated personally by, we're allowing this in America. Uh, you know, my personal politics are, I wish we had a, 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 a national right to housing. I don't think I'm ever gonna see that in this country, but it's just shocking to me. So though the chat could go on for, I've been stop. I'm let Mary talk. I could go on forever on the changes. Uh, what have you seen, Mary? Um, well, the, the, the biggest single event shock that I saw over the past 20 years was the introduction of austerity in the UK. I mean, obviously um, I work in the US as well, but, you know, uh, but in the UK context, that was the single biggest shock because it was, all, it was like the realization of what Margaret Thatcher started back in the 80s. Um, when mass unemployment was rife, when trade unions were undermined, um, all of the stuff that very similarly happened in the US in the 80s that created the foundation for the kinds of destitution that we see now. And all of that was enabled and wrapped up by this big narrative around um, dismissing people who were struggling, saying you do not deserve a safety net because you're lazy, because you're, you know, you're just not worth anything. You're, when human beings worth is put in monetary terms only, we end up with these sorts of policies. We end up in the UK with um, healthcare being so prohibitively expensive, even when it is available, that people haven't got it, um, you know, that there's no national um, foundational health service, um, which in the US context, as you know, Dale, is a huge driver of poverty. Um, so healthcare costs have spiraled over the past um, two decades, three decades, um, but people's wages have stayed the same. Um, in that context, the working poor have become this, a, a sort of huge phenomenon where, you know, the idea that you could have a full time job and, you know, have a home that you knew was secure, you knew what hours you were going to work, you know, you know, you knew you had weekends, you could take a vacation, you could take a holiday. Whereas now this huge swathe of people are working poor and no matter how hard you work or how many jobs you do, you barely keep your head above water. And I think that is a major shift um, over the past 40 years. Um, and yet, Despite that, all of these people are labeled as somehow spongers and like leeching on society. Uh, whereas the structures in that society are preventing them from living the kind of life that their parents or their grandparents aspired to and expected to have. And I think that's, a, you know, it's created, like Dale said at the start, this fury, this anger 
um, because that's, you know, that's totally unacceptable. Now, on the positive side, the other thing I've seen um, is a, a growing recognition of that, a growing recognition of inequality and its impacts um, in the US, like the movement like Fight for 15, Domestic um, Workers Alliance, uh, we, you know, we've seen a real sort of coalescing around these issues. I find that side of it very positive, whether or not that translates into long term change. Bigger question. That leads us nicely to probably the last question. We'll see how we do. Um, of where does it leave us with capitalism? Uh, seems to be very an accepted uh, ideology, especially in the West. Uh, where does it lead us? What, what do we do with it? Okay, quick, answer, I apologize. The sun is coming up and making me hotter. So, <laughs> so I'm blowing out your screen because of the sun's good. Um, I documented uh, uh, a couple years ago uh, the, the, the uh, Evergreen Corporations in Cleveland, Ohio. It's based on the Spanish Mogadon model uh, of a worker owned uh, corporation. Uh, in Spain, of course, the Magradon model is amazing. It employs like 80,000 workers. I mean, my European friends will correct me. I, it's within 10,000 of that, a lot of people. Um, and they're, they're building one of these models in Cleveland. And I think we're going to, we're never going to, capitalism will never end, but we need more of this kind of capitalism. And I can't, and there's no time to go into the nuances of what they're doing, but it's amazing. Uh, uh, they're, 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 they're helping workers. Workers have health benefits. They're, they're giving dignity to work. Uh, so there's a way it does work. It's on a whole other hour of discussion though. <laughs> it is, it is. It come, I'll say it again, it comes back to power. Um, when workers had more power, more clout, um, they were able to do more. Um, and unless you end up with a model where trade unions are the equivalent of trade unions, be it cooperatives or be it whatever, have more leverage, um, then we end up in a situation where, you know, we see what was it was it this week again, looking at the stats on, like how much wealth accumulation has happened on part of billionaires in the past six months is mind blowing. Um, you know, we're in a kind of cauldron at the moment, and it's very very difficult to unpick those, you know, what's causing it, but. I'm with Dale on this in terms of like worrying about the next two years, worrying about the next three years, because I, I think we're at, you know, we're at a point where um, things can go either way. You know, everyone thought the pandemic um, would make everybody so much nicer and would all really understand finally what it's like to struggle because you lost your job through no fault of your own. Um, but we could see a re-entrenchment of the animosities that have been tapped into. Um, and I think, you know, we've got, I think, reporters, young reporters, um, this is where it's at, you know, in the next three years. Um, Poverty is a huge part of that. Um, but that's where we're at, I, I think. I, I think, Dale, maybe you've got a similar view on that. Totally. I think we're out of time. But yes, I, 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 I agree wholeheartedly. That is the story for now. And I would be focusing on it if I were wherever I were. Yeah. Final words, it's sort of based on a question I see about it coming back around to the beginning of the conversation. So if you had to sum up, if you're telling the story of inequality, of poverty, how do you do it? How do you give a voice without exploiting that voice? What would be your last wise words? Well, it goes back where we started. Yeah. Do empathy, have empathy, right? I would, yeah, that's, that's where it's at. It's empathy. And, you know, what Dale says about your job being to listen, first and foremost, because if you listen, uh, that will be your, that will be your jumping off point for making sure that you don't fall into the traps of exploiting people, um, taking them for granted, misrepresenting them. Thank you very much, Dale and Mary, and thank you very much to our audience. And you have lots of questions here. We didn't, we ran out of time, but Mary and Dale answered some of them without me having to put them to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, if you want to read Mary, uh, Mary and Dale's books, we have a handouts page on our website and all the links are there. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for talking to us. This is day three of summer conference. We have one more day and one more talk tomorrow, 3.30, we're gonna to be talking. 
about Africa. Um, so please come along, bring your good questions with you, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Mary and Dale.